will. All right, and three, two, one. What up, guys and girls? It's Bobby and Sean coming at you live. Sorry, it's a little delayed. It is Monday uh, for this week's episode of the Cronus Cast. As always, this episode is brought to you guys by Paragon Recovery. Use code Cronus for 15% off for, or if you're military or first responder, hit them up directly for an additional discount. Um, but yeah, flame off, not gains. Highly recommended. Yeah, and definitely a necessity now. When what did you put in this week? 60 miles? I've been like 58 this week. That's nuts, dude. How's recovery going for that? Are you are you feeling like in the groove or are you doing anything different to get your body ready for the next week? Uh, I'm not doing anything specifically different. I just do like um, on my running days or training days, I make sure I stretch for like do like an hour of body work every night. That's kind of like my routine. Like Christina and I will just watch like the office or put something on TV and then I'll just stretch uh, on the ground. Do like uh, it's mostly just stretching and do some like uh, myofascial release with like a massager. I have one of those so rights. Uh, shout out Joe Rogan. Uh, so right um, for their so as muscle that like massages it. it. I do like lacrosse ball some spots and I foam roll some other spots. Um, and then that's pretty much my nightly routine for about an hour. You've got one of those uh, like hypervolt knockoff. Uh, percussion guns right mm-hmm. yeah I, forgot, I found it on ebay for like 60 bucks um it's, it is like a hyper vault knockoff um i mean like i think it doesn't really matter which brand you buy like theragun versus hyper vault versus all the other massagers but i think i don't think price really like you're just paying for a name and like the uh, hyper vault knockoffs they, they're online they're all the same uh so like you're saying you're just paying like 200 bucks for the knockoff or 200 bucks less for the knockoff Oh yeah. I, I was looking at them this weekend to grab one and it all came down to like the length of the actual piece where it attaches to. So you have like more of a reach if there's any unique features. There's one guy's video that had like 15 guns that he reviewed and breaking down, you know, the impacts of, you know, the, the like the bits on each one, uh, battery life plug-in. Uh, there was one that I found the most highly rated one on Amazon, uh, like some OP pro or whatever. And I was like, Oh, this is going to be it. But then I went down into the comments and all of them essentially said the same thing where it was like, this is phenomenal battery issues after like a month. Mm -hmm. And someone actually wrote, was told if I wrote a good quality review of this product, they would send me a a new battery. So it was like, I don't want to have this, you know, highly rated gun. Now I'm suspect of, because all these people are just writing in order to get a replacement battery because the original is complete shit. Yeah. Amazon's interesting. Well, just any online uh, distributor is very interesting, especially Amazon. Because, like, uh, I don't put a lot of um, weight behind a lot of the product reviews because you just, like, don't really know if they're real reviews or if it's people that – because there's, like, a – I know that people will have, like, a side hustle – well, they're well where they just get Amazon products and then just review them uh, for companies. So they get sent free shit, and people do that as like a as like a side hustle or business where they just get products for free and just review them. So it's like a very I don't put a lot of weight behind Amazon products, and the more I have bought products on Amazon, the more I've realized that like a lot of the products have like fault or like uh, inflated v like inflated reviews, and that. Um, I can't put it, you can't really trust them. The quality of some of the products and Amazon are really terrible. No. And the other thing too, is with a lot of these, you know, browser sites, um, Amazon's, the Google's, I think Google just had to settle for 2.1 billion over in Europe because there was an issue with when you looked up some sort of product that Google had, it's Google product would come up first. Mm. Um, and so, so far as fairness was concerned with the EU, um, they were slapped with a heavy fine and it was just a way of, you know, some public ordering underneath the governance side of information law and communication. So that's one of the things I'm always more hesitant now is, is trusting whether or not the product I'm seeing, whether it has like, this is an Amazon product on it uh, or not. I'm always weary of really overly good comments and, and ones that don't 
contain pictures for me to see and you know how the people are writing if it seems really generic like this is just a great product would always recommend love it 10 out of 10 it's like well that doesn't seem genuine at all mm -hmm. yeah i've actually been a big fan of costco uh pretty much because you know i buy like all our stuff from costco i think costco is pretty interesting uh as a interesting business model because something like uh in order to sell in the costco warehouse the product has to be like the number one on the market or something like that and like to be a chocolate uh, Kirkland signature brand it's usually like the same market leader that produces in for costco but it's like produced at least one percent better than uh, that you can find outside uh, on the market yeah. so i Dude, was like i love costco uh when i, I was still in Colorado springs we go shop there and with covid i think we waited 45 minutes or 60 minutes just to get into the store hmm. and what pissed me off is they didn't have their samples out which I know. Like essentially, why do you go to Costco if not to get samples? Like that, you're just a weirdo if you go there to actually shop. I mean, that's like a like a lunchtime break. Like you'd fill up. Yeah, love Costco. Yeah, we're not sponsored by Costco, but if Costco wants to reach out to us, oh, for they, sure, they've got fitness stuff. I'll take a free, you know, annual membership and talk about the great poultry products that you have and all the other Kirkland signature pastas that you have in the cold section, which is the back of the store, probably third row from the uh, left. The cold section is the best. They actually have, uh, I don't know if last time you've gone or not, but they make bulgogi now. No. It's so oh, good. That's good. <laughs> it's like, it's like better quality and cheaper than H Mart, which is like the Korea, Korean market here. It's like better quality and it's cheaper. Dude, uh, speaking of, like food i think new york is slowly starting to reopen i think we're supposed to head to like phase one by july and then they're going to open up kind of public seating at restaurants in patio settings outside of restaurants and so even if you don't have a patio they're going to extend your property to the street so that you can put out chairs i don't know what's going to look like but i think there's going to be a, a mad rush back to restaurants because i feel like i've been eating relatively the same five to eight meals now for the last couple of months. Yeah. Washington, uh, Pierce County actually got approved phase two, I think last Friday, which means that like retail is opening back up. Gyms are opening back up. Restaurants open back up. But I think restaurants are limited to just outdoor patio seating. And, but I think, I don't know. There's no, bar, you can't say the bars like restaurants are open. <clears throat> so it's like pretty much regularly, almost like everything's open back up up here already. That's pretty cool. I'm, I'm looking forward to everything going back. I have a feeling that come the fall, we're going to have another wave of flus and colds hitting us. And we'll go back to being pretty restricted and, you know, locked in place again. So it's like, I want to enjoy the summer months. I also wonder too, how many people now that the sun's out, they can go and sit outside more are mm -hmm. feeling more positive about things, less likely to go and get tested. And so because of that, some of these numbers are going down because people aren't concerned with the flu season, you know, uh, being passed that, you know, now there's no risk at it and they just don't even want to bother. Yeah. I'm actually kind of curious to see how it plays out. It's funny because with the protests, like before the protest started, you know, the news cycle was dominated by COVID, COVID testing, COVID everything. And then with the protests going on, you don't hear anything about, you know, about COVID, but I'm pretty sure that COVID's still there, but you know, the news cycle isn't reporting as people just forget about it. Right. And I think there was like a wave of news that came out that didn't get uh, a lot of airtime because of the growing protests. I think we're on like night 12 or 13 now, but the massive CDC report that essentially said COVID didn't have quite as high of a mortality rate as we were led to believe during the initial uh, outbreak, you know, two, three months ago. Um, between that and, you know, the potential uh, process for developing vaccines and then the report about hydrochloroquine and uh, I guess that initial report being uh, retracted for having um, some consistency issues. So all of that being said would have probably been a good conversation to have. And it, it doesn't lend credit to, I think, either side's argument when we look at politics. Um, but if that is highlighted, at least in respect to the protests, it, it might indicate that, okay, the protests are safe for this reason and, and the likelihood that you're going to spread a 
uh, less deadly disease is not, not as concerning. Yeah, I would say um, it's also interesting because uh, did you hear about the Clinton hearings, the Hillary Clinton hearings? No, not at all. What happened? I heard that there was a, there she had her congressional hearing about the email server. Okay. And that this also happened uh, simultaneously during the protests, so it was not reported on. No, I didn't. And basically, even... her appeal got denied, and she's going to go to trial or something like that. Wow. So, you know, I'm not one for conspiracy theories and for, you know, uh, things going on behind the scenes, but it seems oddly fitting timing for the Democratic Party when one of their top, you know, politicians is under trial for her confidential email server. And then these protests occur at the same time, which dominate the news cycle. It's the same. I think there's a lot of instances where people aren't reporting. I've, you know, aside from writing some research papers right now and having classes and just training, I essentially keep from, I would say five o'clock in the evening to about nine, uh, Fox News and CNN on at all times, and I'll switch back and forth. Um, I really don't mind watching uh, prime time with Cuomo because, uh, I mean, he gets emotional, but whatever, but like you get some side of a story, but I really do like trying to watch either part of the Ingram angle or Sean Hannity, just because you know, what's going to be covered is going to completely gloss over like anything of value. Like I, that dude was talking to, about, I guess he does jujitsu, um, Sean Hannity and no way. Yeah. Oh yeah, dude. And he, he's, he was talking about, um, different chokeholds and, uh, and while it didn't relate at all to the murder of George Floyd, he was just talking about, you know, you get these doctors on, on and every single time you have a doctor on, I literally would say out loud, I guarantee you he's going to bring up jujitsu and he's going to do some physical motion like this to show like uh -huh. his knowledge of certain clenches. And he did it every single time. And he's like, I know from my martial arts experience and just like, Sean, just knock it off. No one thinks you're tough. Like I, I can tell from watching the video, you're just like that dad that, probably talks a big game, but again, has not been punched in the face. Oh, yeah. So like that side note, what, but what's interesting is the news that was coming out every single day about the protests. And I don't want to belabor the protest point because we hit it, I think pretty extensively last week with uh, re reforming uh, the police state in America. But you look at the issue with president Trump going to the church uh, across Lafayette square and, uh, and the way that that crowd was dispersed and how it was used for essentially a photo op. And now we're getting news from General Milley, from uh, Secretary of Defense Esper, uh, and other individuals that they had no idea they were going over for a photo shoot in which mm -hmm. President Trump held up a Bible and just totally recognized it was a Bible, not his Bible. There's tons of clips out there of him saying the Bible's his favorite book, but I don't think he could tell you a single verse from it. Um, so like we look at that situation and then you go to CNN, that's all CNN is talking about. And then you go back to Fox and all Fox talks about is, you know, a number of police officers being injured in the protests. And it's one of those, you know, we had 225 uh, officers that were injured last night in New York City. And I, I see that generally as if a report, you know, from a couple of nights ago. But then you look, you know, what kind of numbers are we really saying here? Or what, what do we consider injuries? If a, if a dude has a water bottle that hits him in the helmet, you know, it's like, are you going to go under the TBI protocol? And, and is that considered an injury? So it was just the polarity and the news coverage was absolutely shocking. Like we've said so many times, there's somewhere in the middle where there's some truth. Mm -hmm. But again, we're missing major pieces. The Hillary Clinton news that you just brought up, um, actually talking about ways to reform the police, talking about the FDA's uh, licensing of vaccines and how if we really needed millions to be produced, are there shortcuts that, uh, you know, human and health services has uh, created through the FDA so that we can, you know, promulgate rules that better support vaccine production. Like that's the kind of stuff that I feel like the news should be focusing on. Um, in addition to like the uh, public concerns for uh, reforming the, the violence against, you know, the minority communities. But none of that's being covered. It's just like, it's almost like clickbait for, mm -hmm. for news right now between CNN and Fox. Well, it is the election cycle. So it's getting to the point where, you know, 
news sources are now even more politicized. But speaking of like the police uh, violence on police, did you hear about this one attack in California? I uh, was this one where the dude was like ambushed. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I I saw a, a clip on that, um, and uh, I mean, it's just it's just awful. That's the kind of stuff where, you know, you look at uh, the thing that a lot of police officers say is like, don't judge the police force by like you know the couple bad apples. Mm-hmm. It's like okay, it's a it's a valid uh, concern, and you know you'll have individuals um, that support the police, you know through and through it, I'll say like, that's how we should look at the police. And then they'll go and they'll t- attack the protesters for the individuals that are rioting and actually, you know, breaking the law. And it's like, well, you could say that exact same phrase for those individuals, uh, because you've got thousands, tens of thousands of people that are marching peacefully, you know, demonstrating the first amendment, right. But then you do have just a probably percentage wise an equal number um, as to the bad apples on the police force that are causing, you know, these violence uh, to, to, to pop up in a number of protests. And it's like there, there needs to be some acknowledgement that small percentages of people are really causing such major issues. Um, but again, people just, people are really ignorant to the other side and, and they lack a lot of empathy and trying to come to the table and actually talk about issues, uh, leaving emotions uh, aside. Yeah, I find it interesting that, you know, I've seen uh, a lot of people like in the protests, like actually peaceful protesters, like stopping people from like looting or like trying to protect like businesses. Because I think the vast majority of people doing the protesting, they want, you know, you know, to bring change in a peaceful way and protest that. But then you have these bad apples, these, you know, far right, far left extremists like Antifa or Boop, the Boop Boys coming along trying to you know, incite violence or incite anarchy because def- there are definitely like, anarchists in the group that people, oh. like there's videos of like people in all black, you know, with spray painting stuff, like just breaking stuff for the sake of breaking stuff. Yeah, and that's the, that's the worst part is, you know, we talked, you know, you can reference the Boston Tea Party again, like, you know, how do you want to, if you wanted to violently protest or you wanted to cause economic damage, I feel like there would be better ways to channel that message than destroying someone's business that you don't even know who the owner is of that business establishment. You, you might just assume there's some white couple, you, you have no idea, you know, the lives that you're impacting through that kind of destruction. And by no means am I using the, Oh, protests aren't uh, valid because, you know, they don't maintain order. I'm saying like, you know, there's going to be violence and you have to deal with it, but it's just got to be channeled. I think effectively, to look at what businesses you really are impacting and and holding people accountable. And the worst part about this is you'll have 12 to 14 hours of peaceful protests. And then all of a sudden, you know, at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, you have individuals that come out for the sole purpose of causing destruction. And it's really sad for the communities because again, it just, it paints a picture on the protests that is not indicative of all of what their true message is. And, and that's like totally sad. Yeah. All right. And speaking on protests, did you hear about um, Hong Kong and the protests in Hong Kong? I'm imagining like Tiananmen Square since that was a couple days ago. So like what, uh, what happened in Hong Kong? So pretty much the Chinese government passed a new law pretty much saying that Hong Kong loses all of its uh, special considerations and that they're essentially, do you hear about that? And that No, I mean, so I know like in 97 when the British left Hong Kong, it was like a 50 year contract that Hong Kong would be semi quasi independent. Yeah, so, semi autonomous, yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, but then uh, because they've had the, you know, this, the Hong Kong protest has been going on for the last like year now at this point, you know, where they're protesting against, you know, the Chinese police state uh, intruding upon the Hong Kong's, not, I guess they're, they're technically Chinese citizens, but the Hong Kong's, uh, Hong Kongians, you know, personal liberties and rights because, you know, Hong Kong is very interesting because they have the whole history of British rule. So they grew up with like the British, you know, independence and kind of those ideas of personal freedom. But I think it was like last week where China, uh, Communist Party passed new legislature, pretty much wiping all that out and, and uh, saying that, you know, they're, Hong Kong now is under Chinese rule. The same, you know, police state applies to Hong Kong. 
so this was like a couple of weeks ago where they passed a the legislature and then the Hong Kong people have been protesting further still. And then I was just like, it's kind of crazy to, to think about how long Hong Kong has been protesting because it's been like a year now. That's that nuts. We've lost like pretty much all scope of their protests, even though they like, I remember seeing like the pictures of them holding up like American flags and like saying, this is, you know, trying to uphold the American ideals of liberty and freedom and then not just getting trampled by the Chinese government. Yes, I remember last year, I think we talked about it a bit. I think the councilwoman that was in charge of Hong Kong that was supposed to be essentially like a representative of mainland China's goals, but also uh, helped run Hong Kong was in a lot of hot water from both sides because the Chinese Communist Party is like, hey, you are not bringing Hong Kong into our 21st century and the citizens of Hong Kong were essentially saying, hey, you don't represent us. And now all the individuals that are part of this council, we don't have any trust in because we feel like they were specifically appointed by mainland China to you know, subvert our, our democratic processes. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and, then, and then there's an issue right now with China and India on their border, mm-hmm. uh, which I only got through like, you know, going to bing.com and seeing, you know, the little, news blurbs at the bottom of the page. So 2020 has sucked. Like, yeah. I, 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 every single month, I remember the first couple months people were like joking, like, Oh, how, how's it going to get worse? And I was like, all right, I think that's a little dramatic. And now it's legitimately like, no, that's a, that's a decent question. How, Oh, is there an asteroid that's coming towards earth? that's supposed to pass within like a hundred miles this week, the size of the empire state building. I was Googling like what size asteroid does it take to wipe out the human race? Like I need to know, like that, that seems like a realistic thing now. Yeah. So yeah, I think I saw like a meme um that like the aztec calendar was off by eight years so this is actually 2012 in their calendar (laughs) (laughs) and that'll that'll get you know spread to someone's gonna go and do the math and be like well if you count up all the leap years since you know 1450 um that and then our 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 tracking of the lunar cycle we're actually this is 2012 yeah they were right yeah it wasn't me about that (laughs) maybe laugh oh that's awful Oh, not, God damn it. Now I'm going to think that that's a, that's an actual thing, Bobby. Thank you. It might Thank be. For, I don't know. I don't fat check memes very often. How do you know fat check memes? Um, so getting back to the, the fitness realm, uh, this weekend, I know I was lamenting a lot uh, with the workouts that I had. And then I went out for a run. It's been beautiful every morning since Saturday morning, like mm-hmm. gorgeous. The one day I decided to do like my endurance run, it was like 70 degrees at 5.30 in the morning, humid. I went through two liters of water, uh, two like goo goo, uh, supplements. Like I was absolutely wrecked. And like I I had done uh, a three and a half hour bike ride the day prior and a couple miles of running, but like the humidity hit me hard. Like I think that's the, the first time I've worked out in a humid environment in like probably two, three years. Um, I, like absolutely shocked. How, how's the weather been out there for you? Have you had to make any any change to what time you work out at it or any of that? No, Washington's so beautiful. Um, it's been really nice because uh, it's the summertime here. So like some days are going to be cloudy, but like it doesn't get hotter than like 75 degrees here. That's awesome. And there's no like humidity. Yeah, the, <laughs> the weather's great right now, the summertime. I'm jealous because it's... Uh, it's super humid and then you have to almost go earlier and earlier every single day if you want to go to Central Park because you just have like so many people that are out and about walking, uh, riding their bike. I found, I, we talked about it, I'm going to be picking up 9W essentially every single week now because it's the, the best ride in I, probably the New York City area that's at least somewhere that I can get to uh, relatively quickly. But um, training for an Ironman in New York City is, is really hard. I feel like uh, New York City is not very conducive for much uh, any like outdoor activities, period. I wouldn't say like if you wanted to run, it's pretty good. Uh, The Riverside Park on the west side, uh, you've got some walkways over on the east side. Central Park, you know, it's phenomenal. I I think the the main road that goes – uh, around Central Park within the park itself is a 10K, and then there's tons of little trails that you can run on to double up and cut back. 
but biking is, is brutal because if you just want a place where you can ride continuously, Central Park really isn't that because people are walking in front of you all the time. You've got random cars that'll jump onto the road. Um, the same runways that I mentioned on the east side and west side are, are not really well paved. They're super crowded. You've got individuals that you know don't really adhere to this is where walkers have to be on this mm-hmm. path. Um, this is the direction of flow of traffic. Uh, so it's been like really hard for, for biking and I, I've got my trainer indoors, which is nice, but I don't want to like that runs through your tires pretty quickly because uh, yeah. the, the energy and the heat that gets built up between this, this little metal driver and, and your wheel is, is insane. Mm-hmm. Yeah. also like, uh, this is a classic example of like people's entitlement, not doing the right thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, like so many times I'll be like running and, and I ran up to uh, the GW bridge last week, um, which was like a nice little over nine mile run. And on uh, the way out and back, like multiple times, you know, you're in, I mean, the, the, the joggers lane is literally as wide as my shoulders and you'll have a bicyclist coming the opposite way in your lane. And you're just like, you, you just motion to them. Like, where am I supposed to go? If I take one step to the left here, I'm on the rocks, then I'm in the Hudson. If I take one step to the right, then I'm going to get run over by the bike that's coming the other way. Like people are pretty, pretty rude when it comes to identifying individuals that are out doing fitness activities. You know, if I'm walking at dogs, if I'm running and I see someone that's either putting in the effort on the bike or on the run, I'm going to get out of their way. Like it doesn't take me much energy to stop real quickly to allow two to three seconds to pass for this individual to continue on whatever pace workout they're doing. Then for me to like, really inconvenience them so I can casually walk mm-hmm. or casually jog. I, that's, uh, it, that's, again, it goes back to, I think New York city is incredibly selfish um, and, and generally uh, pretty privileged around, you know, the Manhattan area. Yeah, I agree with that. Thank you. Uh, but speaking of fitness, do you want to talk about CrossFit? Yeah. Or lack thereof now. Yeah, or lack <laughs> thereof. When is a uh, when is CrossFit? I mean, can we? You're a doctor. Can you declare them dead? Is that? Are you calling it? Oh, I don't know. So for those that don't know, uh, pretty much CrossFit. Greg Glassman, CEO of CrossFit, uh, tweeted some pretty racist things in regard to uh, COVID nineteen and the VLM uh, protests. Basically, kind of uh, denigrating or the what is it? What's the word I'm looking for? Um, downplaying that the factor of both of the epidemics or both of the events yep. and then, uh, that kind of came to light and then in conjunction with an email that he sent out to this one CrossFit box called Rocket CrossFit which is like a you know like a very inclusive CrossFit um, affiliate basically him like calling them like trying like pretty much him uh, insulting them for trying to you know be socially active essentially so there's all this came to light and then uh, everybody in the CrossFit community has uh, down, has pretty much uh, renounced CrossFit. So we have like Rogue has not renounced it. Reebok has announced it. The two biggest sponsors of the CrossFit Games and CrossFit. We yeah, have Noble big major. And Ramwad just came yeah, out. Noble, no, uh, Ramwad. You have Zevia uh, that did it too. And then you have all these athletes ranging from uh, Tia. Tia Clay. Well, she didn't necessarily renounced from it but definitely said like hey i'm watching it out but like burke wells you have like jason kalipa nc fit you have like hundreds of crossfit affiliates pretty much saying we're done with crossfit um so this is a very interesting time that we live in um so i I just wonder how it's going to play out with crossfit hq you know is crossfit hq even going to be a thing anymore and then maybe like for you might be able to comment on kind of the legal issue because CrossFit has such a, you know, stranglehold on the trademarking and the branding of CrossFit that, you know, affiliates can't even call themselves CrossFit blank or CrossFit can't even use the word CrossFit without paying that affiliate fee. No. And it's like $3,000. I'm sure there's something in those contracts I and mean, they are written by CrossFit. So I don't know uh, how, CrossFit could probably breach its own contract unless uh, affiliates were ensuring that there was some, maybe like a force majeure clause or like barring some 
a gigantic catastrophe. They were, you know, locked in. But I know a lot of affiliates have come out and said, like, once our contract is up this year, we're done. Um, and they're no longer going to be, you know, CrossFit X. I think you've got a lot of really big CrossFit communities that have built up around stuff like, you know, Misfit Athletics. Um, what's the one that's out in California, the green? What? Uh, but they've always had like multiple CrossFit teams competing. Uh, I think oh, Josh Invictus. Bridges. Yeah, Invictus. Like you're going to have, I think, a lot of functional fitness companies come out of this now, like, you know, Invictus fitness, uh, misfit athletics, um, that one that Noah Olson goes to down in training Florida. Think tank, yeah. yeah. Training think tank. I, I think you're going to see a lot of smaller, like CrossFit esque enclaves start popping up and then you'll probably have more sanctional events that are sponsored by a Reebok, by a Nike, by a rogue. I just don't know how you have a, like a larger community wide event, uh, being put on without, you know, a, CrossFit brand esque thing. And it's not like CrossFit has trademarked the methodology, mm. um, but the, you know, because they can't, but I think this is like really challenging. I also think this stems from CrossFit being like really behind the ball on this. I feel like CrossFit tried to lead the way um, through discussions for uh, the rights of, of gay Americans uh, and, and gay CrossFitters are around the world. I always felt like CrossFit had been super inclusive when it came to that. But then when all this started happening and you started seeing like some other stories uh, from within CrossFit coming up, um, which are pretty awful to read and, and we don't have to get into it. You can research it on, on your own if you're listening. Um, but like I started thinking and it's like CrossFit is pretty white like it is, and it and it's not something that I ever really acknowledged because, like, when I was doing CrossFit years ago, I, you know, you just go and work out. But then now thinking about it, it was not a very diverse gym. No, um, CrossFit's never been very diverse. No, the, the diversity was always between like the types of white athletes you'd have. You'd have yeah. like the soccer moms that would show up for the Saturday workouts, and then you'd have that group of twenty-two to thirty-two year old you know, white males, but it was like, I, I really don't remember ever seeing someone who wasn't white inside of a CrossFit box. And granted, like I was in Colorado, uh, for a lot of that, which is, is not an incredibly diverse state to begin with, but I, I just, I'm not, I'm drawing a blank on really diversity being something that CrossFit was known for. No, it's definitely not very diverse but i bet you can make the argument that you know with the cost of crossfit that kind of limits the people that can you know go to crossfit box so you're talking about like you know paying like 150 dollars a month at the low end up to like 250 bucks a month at the high end for a crossfit gym or crossfit box membership so yeah it definitely discourages like a lot of you know low <clears throat> low income people or low income communities uh from being able to partake in crossfit which is you could argue that that's probably going to be the most uh, desired population that CrossFit should be targeting is those that low, you know, low economic and social economic states because, you know, fitness will play a much larger impact in those people's lives than people who are, you know, uh, more affluent who are able to, you know, eat better, you know, live lives that are le that are more healthy to begin with because they're more affluent. Yeah, and you, and you look at, uh, I think this is an interesting segue into like systemic racism. And people are always like, well, what is systemic racism? And then how does that manifest itself in a population? And we look at, you know, the socioeconomic impacts. And so if you have a community of Americans that really wasn't afforded equal rights, and you can go back and say like, oh, you know, we've got Brown v. Board of Education, the 1964, 1965 Civil Rights Act. But the a slowness which with a lot of that policy was being um, – uh, forced um, or supported uh, by, you know, the federal government and how slow states were to respond to that. Like it probably wasn't until the eighties or nineties that you really started seeing a change. And so if we look at it from the perspective that in the eighties or nineties is really when communities of color that had been for hundreds of years, just put into the, you know, literal backseat of the society, we're now having an opportunity to, you know, be successful and not be hindered by some of these, uh, policies that states had enacted or the, the country had enacted, 
it's like you can't say within 30 years um, that their lives or the communities that they had built in these cities would be that grossly changed that affording something like the 150 or 250 dollar price cap that these gyms would put on would be something that would be completely affordable so like that could be like a case study of almost two did CrossFit kind of price itself out of some of these communities that were facing disparate impacts from the systemic effects of racism? Um, I, I think for Greg Glassman too, for a guy that has been saying for so long, we're trying to combat the sugar industry. We're trying to combat the increasing costs of healthcare throughout the country and throughout the world. It's like, well then how come your fitness isn't affordable? Yeah. yeah. And, and you look at communities that have, you know, um, greater issues with getting healthy nutritional food in these food deserts, uh, in urban environments um, that typically also face higher levels of pollutants because these communities aren't protected like a lot of other communities are that are more affluent um, from the effects of uh, the Industrial Revolution Age that's, you know, still going on as, as we develop uh, those technologies as a country. It's like those communities are probably the ones that we should have been focusing on, or at least you should have, if you were really um, as invested in health as you say you are. So I think it's just years of this kind of building up and really CrossFit came out and had an apology, which just read really uh, disingenuously. Like I didn't buy a single word that CrossFit HQ put out. It was very much a, oh my God, I put my foot in my mouth. I'm seeing all the dollars that are leaving my sport that are leaving my community. I have to do something to make up for this. Let me write some, you know, That's iTunes true. note and then just publish. Like yeah. it, it's completely transparent. Like what the focus of CrossFit HQ was and their, you know, whatever their uh, PR department. It's just like it's falling on its face again. It's, it's just awful. Cross, CrossFit is, as I think, kind of getting, kind of getting lost in the last couple of years too. I mean, you look at trying to cut down the games format, the media department. It's like. CrossFit in three years, you guys have gone from like a really powerhouse to like now you really are are, are going to be struggling and you know likely gone. Yeah, I think that uh, it'll be very interesting to see how CrossFit will recover, won't recover, and whether that should just be like another you know casualty of the COVID recession. Yeah, I mean, because that's the next thing. Like, would you pay a couple? If say there's a you know, a gym in your area that is a CrossFit affiliate, or there's just a gym that you could probably get away with doing functional exercises at. I mean, is it worth the $150, like you were saying on the low end to get a CrossFit gym membership coming out of COVID or paying $75 at like a, you know, anytime fitness that has a small functional fitness boutique um, set up within it? So it depends, you know, if I was, um, it really depends because I really I won't say that I I really enjoyed my last CrossFit gym uh, back in Jersey. You know, it was like a great community that the owner uh, and coaches developed in terms of everybody like really enjoyed working out together, and it was like almost like a second home or second family away from home. So I don't think any you know commercial gyms are never going to replace that feeling. I don't think because um, you're never going to really have a community inside a commercial gym or get any time fitness because you know, that doesn't really support that system. So I think there's definitely something to be said about like a class setting of fitness and that, uh, you know, gyms, even though they won't be called CrossFit, will still kind of hold that same model of, you know, we hold functional fitness classes um, based on CrossFit TM methodology or something like that. You know, I think that is still going to be a viable um, business model, but I don't know if, People will just won't well, people just won't be saying that they're CrossFit affiliates. They're just saying they're functional fitness gyms, which I think kind of loses some of that branding associated with CrossFit. But then CrossFit, as far as I know, like CrossFit HQ does nothing really to support you know the CrossFit affiliates because oh. Glassman's always have like this uh, capitalistic mindset of the best will rise to the top, and the ones that don't, that ones that aren't run well, will just go away. And I think that's like you know that's kind of been his motto or. Um, model this entire time as, as CEO of just letting the fittest rise at the top. And then, you know, they don't really support any floundering businesses and then they don't do anything to help the affiliates that are struggling. Rather, it's just like they will figure them out themselves or they don't figure it out. And then somebody else will take over that CrossFit name. I think one of the things I, I would now consider 
in going and getting a, a gym membership is like in in reflection of what we we talked about earlier with CrossFit being a relatively white sport um, and these gyms not being diverse or representative of kind of the the American fabric. Um, I would wonder if that would be also be something if I was looking for a gym that I would now be more acutely aware of and play into my decision making process of like if this is really an environment now that you know as like a, a mature adult that that you know I want to find myself in like do you think that is at all something that that you would consider any more so than you know other factors or, or how do you think that's going to play because now you know you got a lot of people in America that are becoming much more aware of, of their level of privilege um, you know how do, how do you think that happens or, or how it plays out I honestly, I, I don't want to sound like racist, but in my mind, it does not really matter to me how diverse a gym is because I'm not going to a gym to achieve racial diversity or to, you know, get my quote unquote, like black quota in, you know, or diverse quota in. I go to the gym to get my fitness on. Um, so I would hesitate to really, you know, delineate a gym based on how diverse they are uh, in my mind because that's not really what I'm trying to do. But on the other hand, you know, I would, uh, I definitely enjoy, you know, having different people in the gym as well. So I don't, I don't really know, but that plays very low on my, you know, gym, uh, rating yeah. system about diverse gym is. Yeah. Cause that was one thing that we looked at like the social media stuff. Um, one of the things I really disliked about social media in the last two weeks is there, I feel like there are a lot of people that are just trying to get like that Instagram or Facebook clout where, you know, they were just pointing to, you know, their one friend um, who wasn't white and, and like as if that made them, you know, now this like savior to the community. And I, I really, really hated that because it did not seem to, it, I, I think it was pretty uh, deaf to the actual issues. It was just more of a, hey guys, like my post and my feed page here isn't racist and look at my one friend kind of thing. You know, like the, 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 the old uh, joke was like, well, I have a black friend. It's like, well, that that's bullshit. That's like, you can never use that as an argument to defend, you know, your actions or your behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that's like a, a similar approach to like, if you look at a gym and you're trying to identify the racial diversity, you know, is that a situation in which that is a, an actual uh, variable that you have to consider. But a lot of schools, I can tell you, like mine in particular, they're starting to really focus on whether, you know, and it's a, the law school experience has been pretty diverse, both from a gender perspective um, and from, you know, representing minority communities because they're like, they're trying to make a real positive effort into, into representing America within the profession of law. Um, but, you know, they're still trying a lot of different things out now in the coming year to make sure that, you know, uh, marginalized voices are heard. And I think I was an advocate of, uh, that earlier this year when it was like, Hey, we have a lot of volunteer opportunities and like, there's a lot of people here that will talk a big game about supporting these communities, but then don't show up to go uh, on these volunteer trips or aren't taking classes or aren't concentrating their law degrees in ways that help these communities. It's just kind of just empty words. So I'll, I'll be really interested, I would say in the next six months to see if, you know, a lot of these people and recognizing their privilege, uh, you know, actually change and, and do something to, you know, make America stronger. Yeah, I will say that uh, my med school uh, was very service oriented. They have a lot of programs. I think it's because of the, um, how the med school is created and uh, the charter is written. But they have a lot of uh, programs to help serve, you know, on their serve communities or, that, or minority groups to help them get them into medicine. So they have like high school programs where they have like high school kids who come to med school over summers for like summer camps to learn about science. And then they have undergrad, kids in undergrad and um, will come and also do like pretty much like a, you know, like mini med school to help get these kids uh, more into science as well. And then my med school definitely does, you know, definitely uh, attracts or, you know, places a little bit more emphasis on having a diverse student body group, which I'm definitely behind. You know, I think that there's nothing wrong with um, increasing the diversity in medicine because, you know, something like the, you talk about like uh, the, like population of physicians aren't, you know, representative of American population. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think I was like probably half my school uh, were people of color or minority groups. And it was really kind of interesting to see that because 
uh, I remember in my first year of med school, we had like a class about like, um, you know, like about uh, cultural uh, appreciation and cultural norms. I really put my foot in my mouth because I wasn't, you know, coming from military. We're talking about like uh, Muslims. I really put my foot in my mouth uh, in a class discussion. And I was like, oh, I didn't really think about how people would, you know, perceive my statement because, you know, coming from the army, it was like, um, we're talking about like uh, how like Muslim families and the cultural norms in like male dominated uh, Muslims families. We had like a cult, like a case study or like a discussion on like, you know, what would, ha- what would you do if you had a patient who was there, like who was obviously Muslim, you know, wearing a burqa and her husband was there talking for her, for his husband or for his wife, like, you weren't able to talk to the wife directly and you had to talk to the husband, like, what would you do? And I was like, Oh, well, you know, that's kind of like, that's normal. in you know, Muslims in Muslim cultures that, you know, the husband or the wife is kind of the property of the husband. Uh, and that, you know, you, you just have to work with, you know, that like uh, situation and then you know, like, talk to the husband and then, you know, have like a female like nurse come and talk to the, the wife separately. And then, like, I said that, and then, like, the teacher didn't really, it was like, okay, that's a good point. But then, like, the rest of my classmates were kind of, like, horrified because, you know, I pretty much said that, you know, Muslim Muslim women, which is property of the men, um, not knowing that they're, or not really being cognizant of the fact that they were, like, you know, 20, 15% of my class was, was Muslim and Muslim females, too. So, like, that was, you know, just a sign of maybe like my privilege or like a sign of my, you know, being tone deaf to the room that I was, you know, talking to. Yeah. And I think one of the issues too, uh, I don't know what, what conversations you guys had afterwards, if there was like a follow-up discussion, it's like, I mean, that, that's also like a, a, a result of the military training. It's like everything that you're told every single time you go to Afghanistan, which is why you have, you know, CST and, and FET teams is because you're told like, you can't talk to you know, to, to Muslim women, like you can, that is like, you know, the greatest sin an American soldier, um, can commit. And so you have to use either women or you have to use the Afghan soldiers that are partnered with you to talk with them, but under no circumstances are you ever allowed to talk to women. And so it's like that gets beaten into you for eight years, you know? So when you have conversations like that, you, like, it's, it's not like, you know, the army is sitting there and educating you constantly on different subcultures within the Islamic mm-hmm. faith. And so that, that's like really difficult. I, I didn't have quite a similar situation at law school, but when we started talking about criminal justice reform, uh, a lot of the conversations that are happening now we had in my first semester and I have a, I had a phenomenal criminal justice professor and him breaking down these arguments was like really eye opening. And the individuals in the class that were coming from communities that were really negatively impacted by you know, the stop and first clause um, in the 90s here in New York City um, and other similar laws around the country. And a lot of the issues that now, again, we're seeing with police forces kind of being like, you know, very uh, supported by um, a a white community was like, holy shit, like you just like talk about being educated and and really being um, blind to, to like issues of other, you know, American citizens. And I think that's like the worst part is as much as you think that you've gotten to experience the world, mm-hmm. like deploying with the United States Army, serving with an incredibly diverse population, um, both within the military, both within your functional branch, and then the different you know places you get stationed, the fact that after all of that, and and going to college and now you know uh, graduate schools, the fact that there are still so many issues that like you are just learning about um, that have such horrifying consequences is like am I doing enough with my life right now to really make like a lasting change? Like it's one thing to talk about it, but like, is this, is this how I'm using my freedoms and my privileges as an American to effectively make a better America for like the next generation? You know, it's not like world war two veterans where they storm the beaches of Normandy, um, freeing Europe and kind of, you know, making, uh, the American, Americas that is now kind of grown to where it is now. It's like, is this my, is this my D-Day opportunity? Like, you know, while there's a war in Afghanistan, sure, Iraq and Syria, is this one of those social instances where if we as Americans really volunteer, like we can be the next greatest generation because the impacts on, you know, actual Americans will be much larger felt um, if we really devote ourselves to, you know, instituting change. Yeah. And then luckily, uh, 
my classmates were pretty supportive of me and then didn't put me on blast or like destroy me um, in the class setting, which I appreciated because, you know, I think they were able to appreciate um, that I wasn't coming from a place of malice or prejudice. It was just like, you know, a misunderstanding. So they, you know, were able to take me off, pull me, pull me off the side and talk to me person to person and then really, you know, challenge my viewpoints and really help, you know, help me change my thoughts. So I really appreciate that aspect. And I really am glad that it didn't you know, devolve into like a, you know, name and blame kind of shame game of people saying that, oh, Bobby's a racist because he said these things. Um, so that I think was what the, the proper way to, to bring these, you know, bring it about is, you know, education and being able to, you know, just teach people or really tell them about what is, you know, the, what's actually going on. Well, so like we were, we've been talking about it, but like, what's your perspective on all of this with, like in the next couple years, like you say at your med school, like you guys were pretty focused on service um, and representing uh, minority communities and, and getting them access to being physicians and, you know, really growing the community uh, of doctors. Do you see that taking off more so or were there areas within the program that you were in that you're like, you know, what, we could actually improve there. Is, are there steps in the, in the near term that you think will happen? Honestly, I think the med school has done like a great job of becoming more um, diverse. I don't know how much more they can do besides, you know, actively. I mean, I'm pretty sure they already actively recruit and um, give uh, deference to some minority groups. And um, they do, I mean, like, that's a great, they do like a great job. Like I won't even try and say that they don't do, they don't do a good job. Like they have a special program where they specifically, you know, uh, I has not target, but like diff, like um, try to bring in students that come from Camden from Camden uh, itself, and who are come from like you know um, ethnically diverse and then uh, lowish socioeconomics like class uh, communities. So like a couple of my classmates, you know, grew up in Camden, you know, had were lucky enough to go to college and even lucky to go to med school. So I think they do like a great job doing that. And then I think that um, the hospital that we're associated with also is cognizant of that fact. And they have put a lot of money into the community as well in terms of, you know, programs through the med school of uh, getting these diverse and low, low SES uh, students into med school and the science. Um, so I think my med school has done and the hospital has done like, a great job of doing so. But it's also kind of interesting, too, because um, you can see it in kind of the hospital and some of the older physicians that have been practicing medicine since like, the, you know, the 60s and 70s, you know, kind of hold that, you know, that old school kind of mentality of, you know, um, back in my day, you know, medicine was all white, you know, and I don't know, I don't know why it's changing now, you know, it was fine the way it was, you know, why is it changing now? And I think that um, that's becoming fewer and fewer, at least where I am but I can only see how that's still going to be a problem in other, you know, less diverse places, like talking about down South, like I can only imagine how um, non-diverse, you know, some of the med schools and some of the programs are down South because that's just, you know, the social and societal norm down there is that, you know, predominantly white, you know, blacks or people of color don't go to med school because, you know, and then they aren't afforded the opportunities that, you know, more affluent, you know, white people have in terms of access to education as well. But I think, you know, my med school has done like a great job and Rowan University does a great job of uh, getting these people into uh, these programs. Yeah, I think Fordham's doing a really great job. Like as soon as the protests started occurring, um, they were immediately reaching out and talking directly with students, uh, student leaders. I think almost every single day I've gotten an email um, specifically highlighting like ways ahead that, you know, Fordham is going to uh, ensure that, that, you know, they're tackling the issues rather than kind of just being silent to them um, and making sure that, you know, all students are kind of getting this opportunity both to educate themselves on the differences in this American fabric as well as the effects that it has on law. Uh, went to a couple open houses this last year too. And again, there's just uh you know, uh, I feel like there's not at the corporate level and what you were kind of talking about, these individuals have been practicing law since the 60s, 70s, 80s. You know, even with uh, female representation, it is just not a diverse place uh, whatsoever. 
And I think a lot of like really high end schools that are known for producing like corporate lawyers and the corporate law field being so what's the word for just a single color? Uh, monochrome. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Literally like just being so monochrome that, uh, they're going to have, I think a lot of pushback, um, for not being representative enough of, you know, the society at large. So it's like, you know, there's probably schools that are lower ranked than these like, you know, top 14 that are known for more service related law practices, um, that are known for a lot of government work, uh, known for, you know, producing litigators that are going to go work and try to reform criminal justice, um, that I think are probably leading the way when it comes to inclusion and representing uh, diverse communities versus, again, these schools that are more known for, you're just going to go and graduate and make 200 plus K your first year. And then you're going to make, you know, associate and partner in the next couple of years. And it's just like, all of a sudden now you look around the table and you're just sitting in like a sea of white. And I, I think like, the fact that a lot of these corporations too, and you look through the protests the last couple of weeks that are coming out and being super supportive um, of the uh, BLM movement. It's like, you're, I can go to your website right now and see that you have like the whitest of white, you know, board members and, and corporate entities. So like, are you really doing anything right now other than just trying to like pat yourself on the back for recognizing a problem? It's like recognizing it's not solving it. Yeah. Now that you mentioned that, now that I think about it, like the, uh, the, the interns right now and Madigan that I'm in processing with, I don't think there's a single black person. I think it's everybody's white. There might be a couple like brown people, like in terms of Indian people, but I don't think there's any Hispanics or any, uh, you know, people of color in my med school or my uh, intern class. Kind of interesting now that I think about it. Which kind of begs the question in terms of military, like how diverse is the military too? Well, uh, that's really interesting because over was it Memorial Day weekend, the New York Times came up with an article that essentially said like, hey, where are all the like black four star generals at? Mm-hmm. Like we're not like we make up a, a good amount of the military members in service wearing the uniform. But all of a sudden now you get up to that, you know, geo level and it just goes back to being completely white white male. Um, so like, you know, what's the problem with, with the military? I would, I would generally say there's probably, you know, an argument to, to look at that and say like, are we ensuring that we're getting enough representation of, you know, uh, persons of color in these units and within the special operations, Mm -hmm. uh, units within the branches that typically have more general officers, your combat arms, like, are we really representing America enough to, to having a diverse branch so that when we have opportunities to promote individuals, and again, a lot of it, people will come back and say, well, no, like promotions by the time you get to Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel are all based on merit. Well, it's like, you can't really have that much of like a resume built if you're not given opportunities to branch to some of these, you know, combat arms. Um, if, you know, how, how is the military addressing, um, trying to be like, you know, racially blind, uh, per se. It's like, I never thought about that while I was in, I mean, it's just yeah. kind of just like, Oh, whatever. Like people get, people get hired for this assignment. They get hired. Like, you know, I don't know if race plays a factor. So then I guess I'll play some devil's advocate. Like, why do you think that it matters to have diverse, you know, geos or diverse, uh, populations in soft? Uh, well, within soft, I, I would say within the army as a larger entity, you have a lot of individuals that are joining. I think there are probably some feelings that commanders aren't listening enough to, you know, um, contemporary issues that are coming up. You know, I think a lot of the military in general just wants to say, Hey, um, and I I saw somebody on Instagram, some, uh, some Marine come out and say like, you shouldn't care at all about what's going on because you need to be ready to deploy tomorrow. That that's your mission. And like, that's completely like the wrong attitude. If you've got, people that are going to wear the uniform and represent America abroad, like they have to feel like they're included in the conversations that are going on. Like you have to have commands that are doing it for sincere reasons, bringing individuals in and saying, Hey, this is what's going on um, in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, This is what's going on right now in New York city as you know, the army is fighting these battles abroad. 
Like, it's not like once you join the army, you just go, oh, I don't have a race. Like, I'm just wearing multi-cam. Like, no, you, you should still have these conversations. So from that perspective, looking at the racial dynamic uh, of the military, if you don't see individuals that represent, like, your unique background in these leadership positions, you might feel like your voice is either not important or these conversations won't be a priority. So if there ever is an issue where this conversation doesn't happen, um, you know, you won't feel like you're just being disregarded uh, because of the color of your skin. So I think it's important that individuals represent uh, the diversity in the country effectively. Um, and I don't think that that goes to saying like, hey, we should just start, you know, picking leadership positions based on race. I, I think that would be, um, completely counter to the message, but I don't think we oftentimes really have enough diversity within certain branches um, of the military. Um, you know, especially at least from the infantry. I remember going through Bullock and uh, I think we had, I would say we had 170 uh, infantry lieutenants in my class back in 2012. And I genuinely only think we had maybe two black infantry officers mm -hmm. that were going through the course with us at that time in my class. And so it's like, that isn't, that's a terrible statistic. Like, so, and, and if you look at the number of, you know, generals that are picked from a specific year group, you know, I think the majority come from combat arms and you have a lot of infantry officers that are chosen to be, you know, your force comm commanders. Um, so if you already have a below, uh, average number of representatives uh, within that branch um, from the perspective of a, of a national average, like that's just going to be, you know, compound by the time you get to that Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel and GO level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm always uh, kind of mixed or not really sure how to feel about the idea of equality versus equity, you know, um, equality being that everyone has the same rights, but then equities that everyone has the same outcomes based on their rights. Um, so, I mean, I'm pretty sure you make the argument that America is pretty, uh, has pretty, has good equality in terms of everybody has the same legal, legal and, uh, you know, rights under the constitution and laws. But then, you know, we definitely still have a lot of shortcomings in terms of equity, in terms of outcomes, uh, like we're talking about right now in the military sure. and in medicine. But I'm also kind of not really sure of how I should feel about, um, if we really need to have, you know, uh, the same equity across all racial backgrounds, because, you know, uh, if you think about it, like, you know, I like to think that, you know, America is still a, a you know, merit-based system where people who deserve to, you know, make it to the next level do make it to the next level. So I um, am not sure how much more equitable uh, our society or government can be besides, you know, specifically, you know, creating these programs of um, incentivizing corporations or groups to, you know, make more diverse um, populations, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's a really good point where you brought up equality versus equity. I think a lot of leadership in the military, and I think most individuals that have served in any capacity could probably tell you, you know, there are, you know, your tactical proficiency plays a I wouldn't say it plays the most important part in, in your ability to be a successful leader. I think a lot of it comes down to just personality and being like a good dude or a good dudette. But if you're never even given that opportunity to be in a branch or not even given the opportunity, if the army and PERSCOM is not making efforts to ensure that these branches are diverse enough to be representative of a population, then all of a sudden you start creating um, situations in, in which we now find ourselves where you don't have any representation at the geo level or you don't have enough representation in combat arms. Um, I think if the military wanted to do one thing at, at the beginning, rather than saying like, Hey, we need to have of the, let's say we have a hundred battalion commands opening up. Like we make sure 20% go to, um, soldiers that, you know, are representative of the minority community. It's like, well, before we start with that, like just go back to the original branching. Like if, if at branching where we have 1200 infantry slots a year, like, okay, of the 1200 infantry slots a year, at least we need to make sure that 
you know, two to 300 or whatever the, the appropriate value is representative of minority communities are going to soldiers from those communities. That way then, if we start off at then a, a similar um, percentage-based standpoint, people might get out after four years, eight years, you know, not retire and then continue on to this geo level. At least then it will be a more indicative representation of like a fair process going on in the military as it is in the country at that point. That, that way you're creating an opportunity rather than starting automatically and be like, no, they have, they have equal chance to make geo. It's like, no dude, like if you're going to pick between to make a general officer between like this infantry dude with a soft background or this quartermaster dude, like that's typically a no brainer. So if, if our branches aren't from the very start representative of the culture, then like, I think it's going to be too hard to fix it on the back end. But do you think that's like a, um, is that, I guess, incumbent on the military to, you know, hire or to place people in these branches that, um, in order to increase diversity, because you can, you know, you can make the argument that, you know, people that, uh, that when we do that, then you get, you know, people that aren't as qualified perhaps as, you know, the guys that want to go into these branches that are, you know, top of their class in ROTC, top of class at, you know, whatever. Well, no. So you can still keep like a top of the class, like ROTC, if you finish top 10%, you were given whatever branch you chose in the OML. Um, and then after that, you know, it was like needs of the army. So, you know, if you finished 11th percent in that list, then it was like, listen, you know what the risks were of not being top 10%. Um, mm-hmm. You weren't top 10%. The army needs you to be, you know, an MP or armor, like, and that might suck, but a lot of people don't get their first branch choice. Um, I would say this would almost be similar to um, getting female representation in combat arms. And when they opened up uh, the infantry to women and when they opened up soft to women, um, you know, that was so that we had, uh, equal opportunities for women to be successful because they were like, Hey, we don't see enough women that are in these combat leaders positions, uh, further on in their careers. They're being looked over because they're not, you know, they don't got, they don't have this qualification background to be a two-star general in charge of a division because they're not combat arms. I, I think that is probably a similar argument you can make, um, from, you know, leaders in Congress that, uh, you know, minority communities aren't representative aren't being representative enough um, within, you know, combat arms or those branches that create the most general officers. So this is like, just keep playing devil's advocate. So this is, you're saying like we should have more of an affirmative action system in the military to give guys or people of color the, you know, right or the ability to have access to these positions. Yeah. I wouldn't even say it's like affirmative action because like it, it might not even be like, it, it wouldn't be my choice to go logistics. Mm -hmm. But the army could tell me you're going logistics. Like I know you wanted to do this and I know that like you didn't finish, like if you don't finish top 10% on the LML, you know, there shouldn't be any longer like a choice for me. Whatever the army needs is what you have to do. I mean, it's kind of like the needs of the army. I think that's always been something that they've, you know, um, tried to create, um, you know, in, in whatever system it's like, whatever the army needs of you, you're going to do. So you joined to go into this branch, this branch isn't available any longer. We're going to slot you for this branch. Um, so it's because it's not like you can appeal the branch you got. If I'd gotten armor, I couldn't have written first comment. I'm like, Hey guys, I don't know if you know this, like I'm super good looking. I'm super fit. I should be an infantry officer. They would have been like, shut up. You know, I think it's the same situation at that point. It's like, Hey, I really want to go this. Hey, the army needs you here. This is where you're going to go. And if I wanted to, you know, compete to try to get a ranger slot, or if I wanted to drop an SF packet years later and change my branch, like everyone now has that same opportunity. So I don't think you should be really entitled to a specific branch. It might suck if you competed, you know, for four years to set yourself up to get your number one choice. Um, and you know, they still have, you know, a large pool of you know, candidates that they're going to fill these branches with. But what I'm saying is like, you know, give the top 10%, you know, what choice they want. Um, and then after that, you know, you should really start looking at candidates because it's the same argument as to why the OML isn't just based on, you know, number one to number 5,200, you know, in the nation for ROTC cadets. Cause otherwise everyone that, you know, most of the top contenders always want to go combat arms Otherwise you'd have a really shitty uh, pool of individuals that are going, you know, sustainment branches. 
And it's like, that's not how you make an effective, well-rounded army. You're going to have guys that were placing, you know, number 11, 12 percentile going to these sustainment, you know, branches because the army still needs those top performers to be top performers in all branches. Otherwise we'd have just, you know, a huge disparity in talent. So I think the army can do the same thing when it considers race um, as a critical factor in us in essentially determining that at some point, 20 years from now, if it's similar to the population in the United States, we will have a more diverse uh, professional leadership, you know, coalition that we've established rather than trying to fix it proactively, you know, years later when all of a sudden now we have no like large pool to pick from instead of having, let's say 200 uh, individuals from minority communities to, to fill these PL roles at these different units. Now you're down to two 20 years later because we only started with 15 in, you know, 1980 kind of thing. Yeah, I think it's a great uh, point that you bring up. Um, but I, I, I just try to bring up these points because I know some people are going to say like, oh, this isn't, you know, the right way of doing it because we're just highlighting or, you know, giving undeserving or less qualified candidates, you know, access to these positions. But at the same time, though, you know, you, you do make a great point that and at the end of the day, you know, candidates aren't given the right, the same opportunities um, in the military. Same thing that you talk about in, you know, in school or in civilian life. You know, people aren't given the same opportunities when they're growing up. They're not going to be able to represent their communities at the higher levels. And, and here's what I'll say to the people that are like, you know, saying they had opportunities stolen to them. And I want to be as like crystal clear as possible. Fuck you. Like if you can't be branched, like your non-first choice in the military and be successful there because you were thrown like a non-combat branch. Well then guess what? You weren't going to be successful in that combat branch anyway, if that's how like tiny your heart is. Like if, if you were really joining to be, you know, a member of the United States army and to serve in whatever capacity this nation needed of you, and it wasn't your first choice, then you would not have been successful in that branch. And you have so many opportunities to be successful. And I'm not telling you that you have to pay for like, the sins of your forefathers, you might have, you know, your parents might be Irish and you might have just gotten here. But there has been hundreds of years in this country where a community that essentially built this nation was not provided equal access to justice, to education. Um, and we have been like really slow to reform those uh, systems that we've, you know, employed to, you know, create this country um, to be more representative. Um, and dynamic to the to the growing issues. So again, if you can't be successful at what branch the military has slotted you in, and it's not your first choice, like you weren't probably going to be a good candidate for that combat arms because you didn't have the willpower to be successful in difficult positions. So like, again, fuck you, fuck your tiny heart syndrome, like understand there are bigger issues at play. And if you're serving in the United States Army, and you're supposed to be the most like trustworthy uh, people um, on the planet because you're essentially charged with going and potentially killing others uh, in the name of, you know, some movement or some issue uh, or defense of this country. Like you should be able to look at every single person that, you know, sits within the continental United States and say that like, Hey, I've got your back. I understand the issues that you're overcoming and I'm in full support of you. So like, if you can't do that, you're too selfish to get out of the military. If you don't like what I'm saying to you, like, you should probably reflect and be like, am I really being super selfish? And am I really serving in the capacity that I should be? Yeah. Or just being fragile in terms of your own diversity. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think it's great. A uh, great point to make for those guys that question the idea of uh, having diverse or, you know, um, anything else that you would like to talk about? I didn't think we were going to get, I know we said we weren't going to, going to jump into, you know, a lot of the, the conversations that have occurred over um, the last week and we're going to focus a lot on fitness. But again, I think it's one of those things that uh, once we get into a conversation, I, I hope our listeners, um, you know, are open to some of the ideas uh, that, that we've introduced. Um, you know, I think Bobby and I, I'm going to speak for Bobby right now. He can, he can come in and interject here, but I think we're really focused on creating like an educated platform where it's not just like a one 
trick pony that, you know, you're usually going to expect from, you know, like some veterans or from a functional fitness side of the house. Like, you know, we want to be representative of uh, the population and the conversations need to happen because they're just not happening, um, you know, on the major media platforms that you would really hope and expect uh, would drive change and would drive um, this kind of education. So I appreciate if you guys are still listening and, you know, this generates conversation in your formations or at home. Yeah. And I will say that um, from a psychological standpoint, uh, people are very um, hesitant or uh, aren't uh, willing to really listen to alternative points of view because, you know, people grow up with this certain mindset and then this certain belief system. And then when this belief system is challenged, you know, that's damaging to the ego is damaging to your psychological well-being. So this is why people have a tendency to only talk or associate with people if they share the same belief system, they share the same ideals because, you know, it's, it protects your ego, it protects your psychological well-being. Um, so for those that, guys that are listening still that don't, you know, share our ideals, or share the same belief system that we do, you know, I commend you for listening this far because it's not easy to listen or to have your belief systems challenged because it does, um, you know, damage your ego. It does challenge who you are and, and it does, um, and it's hard to do because, you know, we all want to not, you know, be challenged and we want to kind of stay comfortable. But these, cha- these conversations that we have are, you know, very challenging conversations that really, you know, take into account who you are as an individual and really, you know, cause you, to, it should cause you to question like what you believe in and what you stand for because, um, but then you have the all, other groups that, you know, fall into the echo chambers of people that they, you know, so only, you know, share the same belief systems with that who, you know, grow up the same way that they do. So you're, you aren't exposed to these alternative points of view. And I think that's what makes the, um, this country so great is that we're so diverse and we're able to learn from each other and really be able to um, kind of challenge our own viewpoints and really change how we view, view things. So you know, for guys that are still listening, I really commend you um, that, you know, don't necessarily agree with us. I still commend you for um, listening to us and, you know, maybe challenging what you believe in, because that's really um, a very important thing to do is to, to constantly reevaluate and really um, uh, reflect on what you stand for and what you believe in, because uh, at the end of the day, you know, our beliefs often arise from how we're raised and how we're, de- how we develop. And, you know, if you're, you know, grow up in, uh, Iowa surrounded by white people, you know, you're never, you're not going to really understand, um, the plight or the situation that a lot of these urban, uh, people of color face and discrimination they face. So, you know, keep challenging your belief systems, keep listening to alternate points of view, because that's what makes, um, people more educated and more, uh, a better population. Yeah. And, uh, I think to kind of close on a, a quote, um, I was really lucky. I got to see Hamilton, maybe was it three months ago, uh, front row, like my, my friend won the, the lottery for the tickets. Uh, and one of the things that uh, Hamilton says uh, is if you stand for nothing, Burr, what will you fall for? And like you look at how historic uh, Hamilton was on uh, Broadway, both for, you know, the, the amount of diversity, um, you know, Lynn manuel Miranda and, and how he drafted um, this play to kind of represent what America was founded on, but how America has changed over the last, you know, 200 plus years to the point where, you know, we've got people um, of minority communities, you know, playing these guys like Thomas Jefferson. Um, so I think if, if you remind yourself of something like that from that uh, play, it comes to mind for me, um, really sit down and, and write down what principles uh, and, and moral standards you hold yourself to. Um, and then if you're having a hard time trying to be empathetic to individuals that are protesting or, or going through these difficulties in their communities, uh, maybe write down on the right side of that sheet, like some of those issues and see if any of your principles or morals would support or combat those issues and then start addressing, okay, like if I really believe in like loyalty, you know, as an American to my American, you know, countrymen, does that, does that mean I should be doing something with, you know, issue number one? Okay. Uh, I've got this value. I say I'm empathetic. Um, okay. Well, if I'm empathetic, then 
I've not been a fan of this number four issue. I probably should be and educate yourself on that. So I think that would be like a really interesting thing that we can like look at next week or something, you know, come up with a list of things that you stand for. Uh, and then if you're not really living up to, to your own principles. Yeah. I think it's, it takes a very mature and, um, very strong individual to really challenge yourself and reflect on these things because it's not easy to do and that, you know, but the, by doing so you make yourself a better human being and a better, uh, leader at the end of the day. Yeah, man. So we will close with that. Um, we will catch you guys, uh, next week. All right. Have a good week guys. Later. Bye. Bye. Oh, the piss so fucking bad. <laughs> I saw you get up for a second. It's like, wait, hold up. I just don't want to yeah, I had to close the door just because uh, Rocky had busted in.